When it comes to the topic of our school system, I often hear my peers complaining about things they think could change. Topics ranging from curriculum to the way things are graded, to standardized testing, and our failure to evolve at the time. I want to start off by saying that I am not against the school system. Rather, I am confused and concerned. For many years, I loved going to school. The idea of school actually fascinated me. There was so much knowledge there to be absorbed. But as I grew older, that fascination faded. It saddens me to think back to that time of fascination as it's now replaced with frustration. I've grown up since that time of fascination, but the school system and classroom has not. As a junior last year, I found myself really overwhelmed and honestly, I was drowning in work and stress. The nearing idea of college seemed so scary. Was I ready? Did I make it? Was I prepared for it? Well, the answer is yes, as I am currently a senior here at OXA, but when I look back to that year, I have so many questions. Why was I so worried last year? Why was there so much extra stress put on us last year? You have to test well on the SAT and the ACT. They play a huge factor in your career. Oh, this is the most important year. This is on your transcripts. Think about college, but also please be involved in extracurriculars and don't forget about community service hours. This will look good on your resume. All of this while focusing on my seven classes here and my online classes that I took after school. With all this said, here are the concerns and frustrations that I've heard around campus and personally encountered. Bureaucracy. In many cases, we hear teachers talk about how all of our concerns and frustrations are valid and they wish they could do anything to fix them, but they can't due to the fact that admin or school board won't allow them. If we can agree on the need for a change, why aren't we doing anything? Many teachers are trying to make changes in their classrooms, but can't due to the fact that they don't have the funds to do so. Why are our teachers who probably have one of the most critical jobs paid so little? We find that teacher funding and school system is actually a huge debate topic within our presidential campaigns, but they're focused on the college level education. This is a huge concern to me as a child's critical years of development are their younger years. Let's focus on creating a positive environment for a student to grow in. Let's put the funding to our education systems so a student can foster a love of education again. Let's pay our teachers what they should be paid so that the classrooms are a comfortable place where a student can fail and learn from those failures. If teachers were paid what they should be paid, we'd honestly probably have more teachers taking up the profession. If more people were paid what they should be paid, maybe the teachers we do have would care just a bit more. This leads me to my next topic, curriculum. Are we really gonna sit here and tell ourselves that the person sitting next to you learns the same way you do? Everyone obtains knowledge differently, whether it be for visuals or hands-on or through lectures. Everyone learns at different speeds. I feel that this is one of our biggest flaws, assuming that everyone can obtain knowledge in a new concept and subject in the same manner as those around them. The sad truth of the current state of our curriculum is that we've decided that teaching to the test is a better way to judge and assess a classroom. We've decided that the test is more important than the student that is taking it. Here in Florida, there is an incentive which causes teachers to focus on the test and having students pass that test. If we focus on addressing the topic of bureaucracy, which I've just mentioned, there wouldn't be a need for teachers to have such a high stake on X amount of students passing the test for them to achieve that incentive. While on the topic of curriculum, let's address my next topic of grading. I honestly am quite confused when it comes to the topic of the grading system we have in place, as it doesn't make much sense. 100 to a 90 is an A, an 89 to an 80 a B, a 79 to 70 C, a 69 to a 60 D, and a 59 to a 0 F. Wait, what? How can all the other grades have a 10 point variance but an F has a 50? Why is there such a wide range for a student to fail in? In general, an F should be an honest concern. What is the student not understanding? How can we help them? Are we speaking too fast and we need to slow down? What can I do to help? I think if we looked at education differently, we'd be in a better spot academically. It's not when a student learns something, it's rather what the student learns. This statement, if put into action, will make a huge difference in our school system. Why not look at education as a try, fail, try again system? Focus on the student understanding the knowledge instead of when they understand it. Give them an opportunity 
to fully grasp and apply the concept. Focus on the educate part of education. Make the classroom a comfortable space where a student can comfortably make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. On the topic of being comfortable in our classroom, that leads me to my next subject, seating arrangement. It may sound silly, but it actually plays a very crucial part in the classroom. What I'm gonna be talking about today is considered flex seating. And flex seating by definition is a classroom in which seating charts are replaced with seating arrangements. This is an ideal that practices giving the children a choice to see what best fits them. One of the main objectives within flex seating is to eliminate large amounts of sedentary time, which research has proven as a danger to health. A public county school system in Virginia has put this into place with much reported success. An interview with them brought much light to the situation that was at hand. They asked a teacher in her classroom how it was going, and she responded with, well, I was talking to a student the other day, and I asked her, why are you standing right now? And the student responded with, well, we're working on math manipulatives, and I work much better when I'm standing. I can use my hands more freely. So the teacher was then able to understand how the student learned and what worked best for her. Another interview with another teacher later on during the day gave very insightful information as she was asked, what did she feel about this whole situation? She responded with, well, we're working on creating a collaborative working environment for the students, but we can't do that if they're in rows and every child is an island. Having options for kids to choose from provides them with a way to understand how they work and what best fits them. Different students learn different ways in different subjects. Our seating arrangements now are exact replicas of those in the 1800s. Why is everything else in the world evolving but not our classroom? Pulling our classrooms into the 21st century will prove to be very beneficial for the teachers and the students. It gives the teachers a better way to understand their children and the children a better way to understand their work. You will see this in the work that they are producing. This leads me to my next topic of standardized testing. I have personally spent many hours pondering over this concept because this test is really scary to me. Am I really just a score? Does this test really show all that I know? Well, the answer is no. And here's some of the information that has helped me come to this conclusion. The standardized test started out as a way to judge and assess a soldier's capabilities, not achievements. The Army Alpha and Beta test developed during World War I provided a way to judge a soldier's mental abilities. This test was then a model for the school system. Testing promised a way to identify students who might go on to do great things while avoiding wasting resources on slow children. The most important test of ability, the College Entrance Examination Board, was then later formed in the early 1920s. This test was then renamed the Scholastic Aptitude Test, or SAT. I'm going to repeat one sentence. This test provided a way to judge which students might go on to do great things while avoiding racing, wasting resources on slow children. This is how we look at children back in the 1920s, but has anything really changed? We've said that we are making accommodations for children who might not be as fast as their peers. We have made accommodations for children who have gone and gotten tested to see if they have any illnesses that hinder them from being an ample student, but what if the problem isn't the student. What if the problem is the environment that they are put in at school? The way our classrooms are run play a big factor on the way a student learns. Standardized testing started out as a way to judge a soldier's mental abilities and who was a waste of classroom resources. Yes, this test has evolved over the time, but why has this change taken so long? I mean, would it have even happened if this whole testing scandal hadn't happened? This leads me to my next topic of workload. Another complaint I hear quite often is, I have so much work and barely time to sleep. Depending on scheduling, a student has about seven classes a day. This <clears throat> results in about four hours of homework a night. The teacher said that this is just an estimate of what that homework should take for their classes. It may vary depending on how the student understands the subject and if they actually honestly enjoy it. So a student may sit there and easily finish the homework if it's a subject that they understand and truly enjoy, while another student sits there sweating, trying to understand, and tirelessly working at it, and spending countless hours on it, while the comparison of time is not the same. This was an average of what their homework should take. So on average, in a five-day week, we have 120 hours. 
So let's subtract some hours here. Let's subtract the 20 hours on homework and the 35 hours that we would spend in school. Most students also have a part-time job while attending school. Let's subtract that 15 hours from that. I know I personally have encountered a lot of travel time as I do not live close or near a lot of things, so students may spend lots of time in traffic, just as I do, which adds up to about 12.5 hours. Let's subtract that from the 120. Many students have many chores that they do once they get home, whether it be taking their, their siblings home or cleaning up around the house, etc. This adds up to about 7.5 hours. Let's subtract that from the 120. We also see that we are still encouraged to do extracurricular and community service hours, which all together in a week probably adds up to about 7.5 hours. So track that from the 120. On average, a student slash young adult should get eight hours of sleep a night. This adds up, adds up to about 40 hours a week. Let's subtract that from the 120. Well, with all that said, on average, we should have about negative 17.5 hours to do all this. What? That doesn't work. So let's go back before we added sleep into the equation. If we subtract the amount of hours that we have left with five days, we would have 4.5 hours of sleep a night. <laughs> well, that can't work. And it's honestly quite funny as the response I hear from teachers on a daily basis when a child enters the classroom very visibly tired is, hey, you should get some more sleep. When in all reality, I'm sure the student would love more sleep. This leads me to my next topic of teacher compassion. This does not apply to all teachers, but it does apply to more teachers than it should. In many cases, when a student enters a classroom and expresses that they are stressed or tired, the response shouldn't be, well, that's not my fault. The response shouldn't be, you don't understand what real stress is. I've had my fair share of non-understanding teachers. In eighth grade, I had a teacher tell me that you don't know what real stress is. You don't understand adult problems. Well, that year had been the worst year that I had experienced in my school career. I was severely bullied that year and had been the worst space mentally due to that bullying. What she didn't understand was that year I had also, my family and I had been struggling financially. And I was honestly very stressed about the fact that we couldn't pay for things. And she would tell me I didn't understand real stress. What she didn't understand was that my dad and I had been in a bad car accident that year and we were dealing with that all at the same time. What she didn't understand was that at this time, at this point in that moment, my house was being foreclosed on. In the middle of all of this, I felt like I was more of a burden than help because I couldn't pitch in financially. And she would tell me and my classmates that we didn't understand real stress. We couldn't comprehend real world problems. If we need to change the way that teachers are addressing students, we need to look at them as humans. I mean, it may sound silly at the moment, but this is the student's world. This is all they know. Address their stressors as valid points. Give them ways to understand what they are feeling and ways to cope with it. Through all this, the main thread that I see through all these topics is that we are not listening. We've decided that sticking to our old ways is good. We need to sit down, address those topics, and talk about it. Let's pay teachers what they should be paid. Let's make the classroom a more comfortable place. Let's stop teaching to a test. Let's stop letting one test define a child's future. Let's make the classroom a place where we can foster that love of education, bring back that fascination, make the classroom a place of dedication, motivation, and inspiration. And with all that said, the reason that we need to listen is because we have one mouth and two ears for a reason.